point a young prodigy endowed with exceptional science fiction taste for choosing the strange new worlds of Star, Star Trek. Trek. The Star Trek possibilities come from as far as the bows of the ship on the lower decks on to the bridge of all of the starships. And we welcome you aboard a Captain's Log. I'm Brian Kreutz, and she's Lily Fox Lim. Welcome, Lily. Thank you, BK. As ambassador to the fans, we're always seeking to bridge a gap in the fandoms of Trek old and new. But the bridge is the place where... You both are too clever by half with your idioms. First, you, Ambassador, are including all names of the current Star Trek series on streaming service Paramount Plus and Nickelodeon Television with a cunningly arranged way of meaning and purpose. Then Lily uses a double entendre. For the familiar Star Trek bridge setting, also include the bridge wording to bring all Star Trek entities and worlds together. I may be an android, but the English language is a conundrum at times to know what exactly you're trying to say. Learning Klingon death dance and language is hard enough. Please stop with the tease and fill us in on the latest Star Trek news so we can introduce Tom Morga! Well, the proverbial cat is out of the bag now. Thanks, Raj. Tom Morga, Star Trek's most seen stuntman, stunt actor, and stunt coordinator, who holds the record for being the most seen stunt actor or stuntman in Star Trek, is our guest here on A Captain's Log. Tom Morga even played Leonard Nimoy's Spock character stuntman all the way back in the very first feature film, Star Trek The Motion Picture, back in 1979. Yes, well, it was quite the impressive Star Trek career for Tom. Now, from 1979 through 2005, Tom appeared in six feature films and the first four spinoff television series, Next Generation, Deep Space Nine, Voyager, and Enterprise. He doubled main actors like Jonathan Frakes. Your favorite? Yes, love Frakes. Plus, guest actors and played almost every major alien species, Lily. Now, the greatest of greats, Dennis Madalone, even had Tom serve as his assistant stunt coordinator. Tom Morga was born in your favorite city on Earth in North Hollywood, Brian! Yes, I concur, Raj. It has to be Burbank, 91506, where I first lived entering the great state of California. <laughs> <laughs> I know, Lily and I can't wait for this interview with Tom Morga to speak on so many choreography moves, weapons, and untold stories from the stuffman in the trenches, right? <laughs> I'm on the edge of my seat to hear some of those stories. Absolutely. You know, because BK, we've heard the Hollywood phrases, with great power comes great responsibility, and don't ever let somebody tell you you can't do something, not even me, all right? <laughs> you got a dream, you got to protect it. <laughs> These phrases most certainly hold true yes. for a Hollywood stuntman with all of the achievements like Tom Morga. Absolutely, indeed, Lils. Now, let's expound upon achievements and awards for just a moment here. Trekkies, in 2012, the Taurus Lifetime Achievement Award was given to the late, great Glenn R. Wilder, who we know as one of the first stunt coordinators as a group of one-time stunt coordinators on Star Trek The Next Generation very early on. This is before Dennis Matt alone joined. Then on to the 1989 feature film Star Trek V The Final Frontier, Wilder coordinated Tom Morga as a stunt performer also in that feature film. Now, in 2012, Tom Morga received a Lifetime Membership Award from the Stuntman's Association of Motion Pictures. Additionally, the Emmys have been awarding stuntmen in its own category since 2002. As they should. Absolutely, I agree. Now, outside of Star Trek, Tom Morga has stunt doubled in too many films to list. <laughs> <laughs> Lily, you know a few of these. Maybe you can highlight sure, them for let us. Sure, <laughs> let me give you a few, Ambassador. So, besides being a stunt performer in every Star Trek original series film except for the whale one, <laughs> Tom Morga also doubled Harold Ramis in Ghostbusters. He did stunt work in The Shawshank Redemption, and he also played another iconic villain, Jason Voorhees, in Friday the 13th, A New Beginning, oh, yeah. and appeared in The Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2. But my favorite non-Star Trek stuntman film from Tom Morgan was that he doubled for Jeff Goldblum in the sequel film, The Lost World, Jurassic Park. Oh yeah, I love Jurassic Park. Our interview with Tom is moments away on the other side of the break. A Captain's Log returns in a moment. 
Welcome back to A Captain's Log. Lily is here with me. We always do the show together, whether in the studio here or by Open Subspace Channel on the view screen. Now, we both have you covered in Trexpertise, because she's the expert, oh. <laughs> skilled in Star Trek and across the universe, and into your homes on television, and I'm just the middleman ambassador. Now, <laughs> speaking of middlemen, our stuntman and stunt doubling actor, Tom Morga, has done all those roles more than a hundred times on Star Trek, and he's our guest here on A Captain's Log. Yes, and if you, like me, or even that Star Trek are standing next to me, BK, <laughs> we've seen a lot of Star Trek, hundreds of episodes, and more than a dozen movies. Well, chances are you've seen the recognizable face of Tom Morga in many, and I mean many more of those productions than you can even count. <laughs> I'll bet I've seen Tom Morga on screen more times than Spock has cried or laughed, for that matter. With great admiration for Tom, I did the math on episodes he's been in, and yes, it's true! Roger! Well, speaking of Spock, Lily, Tom Morga, he began his illustrious career doubling Spock in 1979's Star Trek The Motion Picture. Wow. Pretty impressive, right? Now let's welcome him to a captain's log because there's so much more to talk about, including that. With great pleasure, Lily and I welcome Tom Morga here on a captain's log. Hi, Tom. Welcome. Well, thank you very much. Pleasure to be here. Tell us how you started as a stunt performer and did it begin with some acting and plays at a very young age? Please tell us how this leads up to you in college and into your first smoke jumper gig. I didn't do a lot of uh, acting or anything in school particularly. I was in the senior school play, but it was a minor little role. I didn't even really think of being in film too much. I mean, everybody in, in and around the area thinks about it, but uh, I didn't consider it. I was working for the Forest Service when I was in college and I was uh, took a major in biology. I was going to get a degree in biology, work for the Forest Service, etc. And I was working as a smoke jumper. And for those who don't know what a smoke jumper is, uh, there's a lot of different fire crews that fight forest fires. And one of the more elite ones is called smoke jumpers because they take uh, most of the uh, backcountry and wilderness areas where there's uh, lightning strikes that will start a fire. And if they're small enough, you can put them out with a few men. And the best way to do that is to fly in an airplane, jump out with a parachute, hit the ground, go get the fire before it gets big. So that's what a smoke jumper is. And I was doing that uh, in 1969. They they were doing a TV show at the time called Wild Kingdom, Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom. Kingdom. And uh, Marlon Perkins was the star, and he would do various animal shows all around the world. And he was just, they had a script to save a wild buffalo herd from a forest fire. So they used smoke jumpers. So here I am jumping out of an airplane, landing on the ground, going on fire, you know, on the fire line. And they used us doing that part of the scene uh, when they were fighting the forest fire. So that was my first thing on TV or anything. Of course, the, you know, the Forest Service volunteered us to do that. So we had no, you know, I didn't have a Screen Actors Guild card. I didn't get paid for it. I wasn't getting any credits, but I was in it. I love that story and how you shared it early on in your career. Thank you. There's a school you can go to in Santa Monica. And there's a guy that teaches guys and you get started with him. So I did. I met the guy, uh, a lot of guys there. I liked it. I stuck with it. And pretty soon I was a stunt man. Yes. And Tom, that stunt school in Santa Monica that you referred to, that has to be the same one that Dennis Madelone would eventually attend, right? The school I went to was called Paul Stater's Stunt School. Paul Stater was a stuntman that had been there for years, had had uh, started in the 30s, and uh, he'd been well-established, and he was teaching different people, and, and that's uh, where I met Dennis Madelone. He came from New York, and he was a, about, I think about six months after I was there, and in walks this kid, you know, and he says, oh, I want to be a stuntman too, and et cetera. So we... We all worked together and learned how to do fights and falls and and uh, boxing and fencing and different things. And pretty soon, you know, we were good enough to try for a shot and we eventually got in the business and never turned uh, <laughs> never turned around, just kept going. Tom, your Star Trek career opened up in 1979. Prominently displayed in the end title of the film Star Trek The Motion Picture is the phrase, the human adventure is just beginning. And this is exactly 10 years after the Star Trek television phenomenon became a part of life, shared in 47 different languages. Well, your stuntman adventure in Star Trek was literally a human adventure, and it was just the beginning, Tom. You played Spock's double, 
much more to the story with a spacewalk and your space environmental suit and your Klingon in makeup. The first officer with cranial ridges seen for the first time. I was uh, doubling for Spock's first officer and being the first officer for the Klingons. And uh, they actually let me say a couple of Klingon words because there was dialogue at that point. This is where Vidor is engulfing the Klingon ship. Mark Leonard, who's playing the captain, tells me to tell the crew to go to tactical. So I said that in Klingonese, which uh, I certainly didn't know what it was <laughs> at the time. <laughs> Something like, wak chu, wak cha. And uh, so we all died together here. <laughs> my first thing on Star Trek. There's a lot of firsts in this first motion picture for you as well. You're the first Klingon to speak in the Klingonese and have the Klingon ridges. Yes, and I hadn't really thought about that till you just said it. They used me to basically uh, size the uniforms. They wanted somebody about my size, and so I was there, uh, and they sized me up for the, for the Klingon suit. And I remember when they brought out the makeup and we says, what happened to the Klingons, you know? They get run over by a tractor. <laughs> 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 then Svog, you doubled the iconic Vulcan first officer and fell below a bridge chair in a scene captured on camera. We're showing viewers that now. How amazing was it playing Nimoy's double? This is my first time to do something in a big major motion picture and it's Star Trek. And of course, they, they don't, they don't want any cameras and then you know it's all uh, pretty well secured and so you're not going to take any pictures that'd be the last thing you think of doing well here i am on the set and leslie hoffman who had worked well i've known her she was at the same uh, uh, paul stater stunt school with all of us and so she knew what we were doing uh, everybody kept in touch and she came to the set that day I was working and she says, I got my camera. Let me take a picture of you, Spock. And I said, oh, you can't bring that camera. You know, you can't do that. We says, well, here, we were in the dressing room. I says, well, here, shoot me right here. And I'm in the dressing room, look in the mirror. So then you get two shots of both sides of me. And she took that shot real quick. And I never used it or showed it for years and years and years because I didn't want anybody <laughs> to think I was out taking pictures during the, the shooting. Love it. That photo of you in the dressing room as Spock is iconic in itself, and now we know the story behind it. Thank you, Leslie Hoffman. Now, we're going to show another picture of you in the dressing room as Spock side by side with you doubling for Leonard Nimoy in the orange spacesuit. Now, Tom, my next question leading up to this one is you're also in a spacesuit inside this helmet from 1979's The Motion Picture Film. And also some of the lighting caused a major delay and Leonard Nimoy talked to the crew about changing wardrobe. Can you tell us about this? You know, it's a little story that nobody really knows about particularly because it was kind of personal. But uh, when they first created the suits to be used on, on the motion picture, they used a, a regular wetsuit polypropylene. It was like three quarter inch wetsuit, which made, you know, is made a good looking suit, but it was so hot. And with the helmet on, uh, they hung me up on the cables and pulled me out to the lighting area where they were going to set the gels and set the lights. And they were having a lot of trouble. In fact, that DP was replaced later on. He was having a lot of difficulty making effects work, but I was out there for I don't know how long, a long time. And I was just getting stewed like a tomato. <laughs> And, and I'd kind of uh, give them a little wave and, you know, nobody's paying attention to you. You're just hanging out there in space. There's nothing to worry about until, you know, they have no idea what's going on. Well, they finally brought me down. When they took that helmet off, the steam came out of that thing. And I'm, I about collapsed because I was, I was, I was stewed, boy. <laughs> and that suit also, it was real tight across the shoulders and there's a pressure point right here somewhere around your neck and shoulder where if that pulls down long enough, boy, it starts to hurt. And we'd say, you know, these things really hurt our shoulders. And they says, well, it's the suit, you know, don't worry about it. And okay. Well, we suffered with that where they're going through a lot of these uh, makeup uh, setups and stuff. And then when they get ready to shoot, uh, Leonard came in and he put the suit on and he hung, got him hung up and immediately says, hey, this thing hurts. <laughs> and he came back down and said, we can't be wearing these things. You got to do a whole movie like this. And they says, oh, OK, yes, sir, Mr. <laughs> Mr. Nimoy. And they made a new suit. <laughs> Tom, I remember there was another part to this motion picture spacesuit story later on at Grand Central Station. Can you share that? I was funny because these suits, uh, the stunt coordinator and I were 
he had a yellow one for uh a kurt and i had this color for for nimoy and there were a couple shots of us hanging out there that they originally had started with to do shoots for uh you know what they're going to make but they didn't do it but they didn't use that suit but that shot evidently somehow or another got used in a promo that was on a tv in grand central station in new york that says star trek coming and here's these two guys you know hanging out in space and i i remember going i'd been going through new york at the time when i saw that and it was the wrong suit i just it tickled me to think geez <laughs> <laughs> what they showed the public wasn't what they were going to see. <laughs> Tom, my distinct first memory of you on screen is in 1984's Star Trek III, The Search for Spock. You're in a Starfleet officer trainee uniform visiting a San Francisco bar with Tribbles and a laser holographic games on the table. <laughs> Remember those? This is now your third consecutive Star Trek movie. Are you thinking, well, Star Trek really liked me. Maybe there's a career in my future. Can you tell us what you think? So when I'm on this feature, I felt pretty comfortable the fact that I was able to get on and work. And uh, I think um, this is the one that Leonard was a director for, wasn't he? Yes. On, uh, Search for Spock. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's right. Star Trek Three: The Search for Spock, directed by Leonard Nimoy. So he's such a nice guy. Since I dealt with him, he brought me in a production meeting and the uh, coordinator at that time. I belong to the Stuntman's Association. There's another group called Stunts Unlimited, and the coordinator on this show uh, was from Stunts Unlimited. So the chance for me to actually work on the show was not that great. But Leonard said I'm his double, so they brought me in. And we're in the office, and he says, listen, um, now at the beginning we have an alien. Uh, let Tom do that. And then when they do the Klingons, Tom could be one of your Klingons, and then, of course, he'll double me. And the coordinator says, oh, okay, fine, fine, all right. And all of a sudden, I had a, had a whole lot of work I could get to do because of Leonard. So I was real pleased. Awesome. And, you know, what are you going to do? You're new and you think, well, maybe that's the way it works all the time in Hollywood. Or maybe I was just darn lucky. <laughs> and in this scene, they had set up this particular scene where they're looking for Spock and in I uh, there's a conversation with an alien as to finding where he is. And there's a things happen and then there's this fight that breaks out so they had several of us stunt guys in the, in the bar there ready to be able to use for this fight which we did and it was an okay fight you know but when the film came out they had scrapped the fight so all you saw was just me in a starfleet at the door when everybody walked in so you get a, a kind of a pan shot where i was included so that's how that came about i love that story tom and again that's the first scene of star trek i ever distinctly remember seeing and uh you know there's a lot of scenes that lily and i have seen you in on star trek that's impressive there really is <laughs> tom you played so many characters and doubling in every sequel series in next gen but let's talk about more sequel films of star trek you traveled to Alaska to play as the brute shapeshifter when Martia changes shape in Star Trek VI, The Undiscovered Country. Tell us about Ruripenthe and trekking across the glacier as your favorite moments in Star Trek VI, The Undiscovered Country. This was really a neat thing too because I was doing this part and I was asked to the cast uh, script reading. So I got to sit there and just say nothing because I didn't have words, but I was there. So it was kind of interesting because all the actors were there that day and we they went through the script. And I was able to be this character and uh, it was the brute and they were real excited because they were going to do this uh, changing where they could, you know, change one person into another. And it was it was a new technique and uh, they were excited about it. Uh, unfortunately, Arnold Schwarzenegger's film Terminator 2 yeah. and they did some outstanding stuff and so our little bit here didn't get the credit it should have because we were trying to be the first ones to really put something on film where you could transition one to the other but at any rate this was the character i played i shape shifted into the a little girl once and then back into the lead uh, this was quite a quite a bit of makeup though and it was uh made over a suit that was for uh you know cold weather so i had a, a thermal suit uh underneath me and then they had all kinds of different pelts and and uh different animal skins that made up the outfit and of course this makeup was all glued and i had a big headpiece on and you know the wig so it was really very hot they take a helicopter out to the glacier and we get there and start filming but 
it was pretty still there. There wasn't a lot of wind, and and even on the, on a glacier, even when it's cold, if the sun's out, you get warm. And I got so hot, it couldn't believe it. I was almost going into hypothermia. I, in between takes, I'd I'd lift up the the uniform stuff and all the all the uh, skins uh, that were over me, and I just get as close to bare skin as I could, and let the uh, helicopter that was by just blow the wind on me. <laughs> <laughs> it was just a little bit different than we expected, <laughs> but it was quite of an experience. In fact, that makeup uh, they did a poster they have. It was called the the movie makeup poster from the big picture, and they had they had uh, a sequence of the makeup that they went through with the makeup artist i don't think you can see it too well but each step shows you each of the pieces they put on me until they finally got to the brute Dang, and that, remarkable. Was, that was something they, they did for some rules to show them what movie makeup was like Wow, that's remarkable. You're on a glacier in Alaska for the Star Trek VI film, and you're burning up under all those layers and makeup. What a cool story. Thank you, Tom. Wow, yes. We're going to jump forward to Star Trek The Next Generation's final season in the episode titled Attached, centering around Crusher and Picard, where they were actually able to read each other's thoughts. Now, Tom, you yourself, along with other Pryat troopers, capture Gates McFadden's character, Dr. Beverly Crusher, after Crusher disables the force field just long enough for Picard to get through. However, she is captured by your forceful grip. Now, we prominently see her character, the Priot Guard Trooper. Tell us about this episode experience outdoors at the Bronson Canyon in California. And this episode was directed by Jonathan Frakes. Uh, this is Bronson Canyon. They did lots of films there. In fact, we did Star Trek uh, The uh, Brute was in those Bronson Canyons. So we use this location on the theme, on one of the films, but this has been used for years and years. A bunch of us were wearing print outfits and we were, like you said, we were chasing Picard and Crusher. And when we got to him, uh, I grabbed her and I had a communicator and I was able to say, I've caught the woman, but the man's in the print, out of the print area or something. So once in a while, stunt guys get a couple of words and I got a couple, a couple lines there. Tom, prior to this, in season six of Next Generation, you also receive a compliment from Patrick Stewart getting shot falling backwards in the episode Chain of Command down in the caverns of Cardassia. Can you tell us about that? This particular one, we're in the canyon at caverns and we're kind of huddled down and almost on our hands and knees. And I'm facing him on my hands and knees, almost trying to reach him. And he tools his behavior and shoots me. So I take a big push and just kind of unfold myself backwards and fall back. And as I did that, I get that. I looked at the expression on his face. He went, wow. <laughs> so it was like a compliment for me. I, you know, how often does, does the lead actors think that was pretty good? Quite the compliment for you doing your stunt coming from Patrick Stewart. Tom, please go into detail about your taping day at Paramount for the first season Star Trek Deep Space Nine episode titled Battle Lines. Now, Dennis Madalone explains the choreography battle session with weapons was a very big day. Now, was that a memorable moment and shooting day for you? And also, how did you bring your own weapon to the lot for shooting that day? It's kind of an interesting story. Dennis and I, uh, I would help him sometimes in production meetings. But this particular time we were together, I went in with him and we were going to uh, have the production agent for uh, battle lines. And in the script, they have all descriptions of stuff. And they said, well, now these two uh uh, you know, tribes of uh, Anderson. But anyway, there was two tribes and they would fight each other and kill each other and then come back to life and they continue to fight. And they would use a pole arm is what they had in the script. Okay, so they'll be fighting with this pole arm. Well, I'm sitting with Dennis and we always have the same difficulty in as stunt guys, uh, props, costume, uh, you know, wardrobe, they'd make things that looked good, that worked on camera, and they really thought good. But, you know, when you in your hand, you got to make a, a fight with this thing. It's difficult. Sometimes they're very fragile. Sometimes they're awkward. Sometimes they're dangerous. They're big and heavy. And you know, we always say, God, why can't we get involved in making these weapons that they like to use all the time? And so I'm sitting next to Dennis, and we knew we were going to have the original meeting in the morning, and then they're going to follow up in the afternoon with a, with a continuation of the meeting. And I looked over at Dennis and said, hey, Dennis, why don't we design this thing? 
And he says, what do you want to do? I says, well, I'm going to go back to the house. He said, I can make up something and bring it here. And then we, we could suggest that they'd make something that we could use, really use, you know, that would be handy for us. He says, yeah, good idea. Do it. Now, Tom, do you still have this weapon? And here it is. Yes. <laughs> That's the very one I took to the production meeting. This is just a piece of cardboard. I cut it out and used a little silver spray I had in the garage. And I put this ball on the back end of it, and you could see you could really use it. It's handy, and you could butt strike with it. You could cut, you could slash, you could jab. And so we really had ourselves a weapon we could use. The only thing is, when you do that and you put it in the hands of someone else to create, they'll make something out of it. Well, of course, they said, fine, well, you can use that gift to prop. So we gave it to the prop people, and they said, okay. And they went ahead and made something else. And what, what they came out with was this. <laughs> now that thing is a real weapon it's solid and it's made out of metal it's got a sharp point and it's very awkward if you were to get hit by that you really get hurt so we went back to these that's a great start we really like it could you make it a little lighter and maybe not as big a blade it doesn't have to be that much blade so they reduced it and made it more like the original we had and we used that in the film so that episode what you see they had a little progression to the weapon but we got to put our our input on and we got a pretty good weapon that we enjoyed working with that's awesome i love that the evolution of that on how it came about in the progression where you're going back and forth with the props department telling them it's too heavy oh well that's a start make it lighter please <laughs> <laughs> thanks for sharing that tom a captain's log returns in a moment. Welcome back to your Star Trek source for news and interviews here on A Captain's Log. We're honored to have Tom Morga with us. Tom, you were the stunt double for Jonathan Frakes as Commander Riker for the first half of The Next Generation and from time to time when there needed to be a second or maybe even a third Riker, like in the episode Second Chances with Mark Riccardi. Tell us about this episode dou doubling for Jonathan Frakes and Dennis coordinating the stunt. I enjoyed doubling for Riker. I was, I had to pad up just a little. I wasn't quite as big as he was. When uh, we did this show, we needed the two Rikers to uh, work together because it was, Thomas was talking to his former self that had been stranded on a planet and he was going back to see him, et cetera, et cetera. A little complicated, but that's whatever the story was. And we were set up with this uh, catwalk that goes across and it had a part that would fall out. And the idea was that it would break away and then he'd have to help himself get pulled back up and pull, pull his other Riker up there. And Dennis and I would go in like on this particular show, we go ahead and schedule a, a few days or so and start rigging it up and make it work. And I was the Riker guy then. And I set up uh, the fall and we had it wired off and we got a couple of takes on that. In fact, there's a little video I, that we can get that shows that action where Dennis is calling the countdown, five, four, three, two, one, hit it and it falls and I fall, I grab, etc. cetera. Are you ready, Tom? Let me know. So many amazing moments with you doubling for Riker. Please briefly talk about your nice gesture of handing over the Riker double role to Mark Riccardi. We had to have a, sef a second Riker. And and this is how McCarty uh, got started. And um, he was actually a little bit better. I had We had plenty to do on Star Trek, so it wasn't a big deal. So that put him in that position. And so he kind of moved into being an ND stunt guy to be able to double Riker and it worked around pretty good for everybody. Tom has shared some insightful stories and we've seen never aired behind the scenes footage from Tom's stunts and a rehearsal here on a captain's log. And there you have it. We have the inside track on Trek. More next week with Tom Morga in part two of our interview. Bye for now.
Casted yourself into a 